What kind of a man would marry and stay with a woman who is adulterous, who is cheating? As a matter of fact, who is constantly cheating, who you're having to constantly go after and bring her back. What kind of a man would do that? What kind of man would marry someone like that? Is this some sort of weak man? Well, the question has to be asked then, how much does he love her? He must love her an awful lot. Well, the fact of the matter is that's the wrong question because in this regard, in this story, the question isn't how much does he love her? The question is how much does he love him, meaning God? How much does Hosea love God? And then what kind of a woman is Gomer? What kind of woman would see that kind of a love and would see that kind of honor and devotion that someone would lavish her and take care of her and still turn her back on him and go after other men, men who are clearly below the husband that she has. What kind of woman would do that? Well, I'll tell you who Israel, but not just Israel, we the same way. When we read the book of Hosea, and we're not going to read all of it, we're going to kind of move around, but there's really two or three chapters I want to focus in on, really three chapters. And we're going to see a lot of what God is trying to do because Hosea in marrying Gomer and taking her is doing what God wants to do. Now, you might say, like many of us would say, Lord, could you use somebody else? Could someone else be the example? But he chose, chose a man who loves him and who honors God and is willing to be used by God. And so in Hosea 1.1, the word of the Lord came to Hosea, son of Beri, in those days, uh, during the days of Uzziah, Jotham, Ahaz, Hezekiah, king of Judah, in those days. So to get a little bit of a time frame, we see over here where we look at where the prophets are. Hosea is prophesying to the northern kingdom. And so you're going to see in this, you're going to hear him talk about who lives in Israel. You've got Israel to the north and you've got Judah to the south. And we're going to notice something that we won't really talk about here, but we might bring up some other point in time regarding Ephraim, who's also in the north with Israel. But that being aside, let's go to verse two and continuing. When the Lord first spoke through Hosea, the Lord said to Hosea, go take for yourself a wife of harlotry and have children of harlotry. A couple of things. One, we don't know if this is the way she was prior to marrying Hosea. The Bible's not really all that clear. I would like to think, I would kind of think that she probably is. Uh, but if someone were to say that, no, she became that way afterwards, that's fine. I wouldn't argue that point because the, the main point, the most important point is that that's what she was afterwards. And so he says, also go and take for yourself a wife of harlotry and have children of harlotry. Wait a minute. The wife being one thing, but also the children as well. That can be hard because he's still a man. And the fact that his wife is going to be this way and that his children are going to be that way also, that's a problem. At least it would be for the rest of us, he says. Uh, so he went and took Gomer, the daughter of Deblame, and she conceived and bore him a son. And the Lord said to him, name him Jezreel for yet a little while, and I will punish the house of Jehu for the bloodshed of Jezreel, and I will put an end to the kingdom of the, of the house of Israel. On that day, I will break the bow of Israel in the valley of Jezreel. Then she conceived and bore and gave birth to a daughter. And the Lord said to him, name her Lo Ruhama, for I will no longer have compassion on the house of Israel that I would ever forgive them. Now, this point is that he would never, ever, ever forgive them, that he won't continually just forgive them just because. Just always forgive them because he's going to punish Israel. But I will have compassion on the house of Judah and deliver them by the Lord, their God, and will not deliver them by the bow, sword, battle, horse, or horseman. Now, they are getting ready to be sold into captivity. They're go, they're getting ready to be taken over. And so this is this is kind of preceding that. Verse eight, uh, when she when she had weaned uh, her, uh, Lo Ruhama, she conceived and gave birth to a son. And the Lord said, name him Lo Ami, for you are not my people and I am not your God. Yet the number of the sons of Israel will be like the sand of the sea, which cannot be measured or numbered. There's a reason for him saying that even though what he's going to do to them, he still says, yet the number of the sons of Israel will be like the sands of the sea. So they're still going to continue. He's not going to utterly destroy them, but they are going to be punished. Now, as we read, we're going to begin to see how God is going to start using what's happening with Gomer and with Hosea to signify what's going to happen with God and the children of Israel. So continuing in verse 10, uh, he says, and in the place where it is said, you are not my people, I, it will be said to them, you are the sons of the living God. So he's going to, at some point in time, bring them back. 
and the sons of Judah and the sons of Israel will be gathered together. So right now, again, we see this dividing between the northern kingdom and the southern kingdom, between Israel and Judah. At some point in time, he is going to bring them back together again, and they will appoint for themselves one leader, and they will go from the land, for great will be the day of Jezreel. Uh, chapter 2, verse 1. Say to your brothers, Ami, and your sister, Ruhamah, contend with your brother, contend, for she is not my wife, and I am not her husband, and let her put away her harlotry from the face and her adultery from between her breasts, or I will strip her naked and expose her as on the day when she was born. I will also make her a wilderness, make her like a desert land, and slay her with thirst. Now, he's not speaking really about Gomer. He's speaking about Israel here. What is he going to do with Israel? All of these things that he's saying, he is going to do and deal harshly with Israel. Then he says, also, I will have no compassion on her children because they are children of harlotry. For their mother has played the harlot. She who conceived them has acted shamefully. For she said, I will go after my lovers who give me my bread and my water, my wool and my flax, my oil and my drink. Therefore, behold, I will hedge up her way with thorns. And I will build a wall against her so that she cannot find her path. So this is what God is going to do with Israel. We've seen how that has happened, how he dealt harshly with them, which when there are times where we want to apply certain passages to certain people or make them apply to us, even when the Bible will say something like there's no weapon that's formed against us or pro prosper, there's going to come a point in time when that's going to be the case. But right now, what God is doing with them, he is going to hurt Israel. He is going to punish Israel. Now, he's already stated that he's going to bring them back. He's going to deal with them. And this has always been the case. But we're seeing uh, kind of a picture between Homer, I mean, between Gomer and uh, Hosea. But we're seeing kind of this, but we're seeing in this picture between Hosea and Gomer, the same picture between God and the children of Israel. But not just the children of Israel, because he's going to introduce someone else. Some of these promises that we see in the Bible are not just for Israel in the Old Testament. God still does bring up the promises that he's going to have with us as Gentiles. Sometimes we miss that. And so what people might have the tendency of doing is to put themselves in the middle of the story. We call that sometimes narcissists where we see ourselves in the story and we kind of conflate Israel and the church. Israel and the church or Israel and the Gentiles are not the same. They are distinct. However, though God has made plans and promises for Israel, he's made plans and promises to save people who are not his people. And we're going to see that. Verse 7. She will pursue her lovers, but she will not overtake them, and she will seek them, but will not find them. Then she will say, I will go back to my first husband, for it was better for me then than now. So we're going to kind of see her kind of being fallen and having to go back to her first love. He says, verse 8, for she does not know that it that it was I who gave her the grain, the new wine, the oil, and lavished, her, lavished on her silver and gold which they use for bail. Therefore, I will take back my grain at harvest time and my new wine in its season. I will also take away my wool and my flax given to cover her nakedness. Then I will uncover her lewdness in the sight of her lovers. This is what God is going to do. I'm sorry, has done with Israel before all the nations and no one will rescue her out of my hand. And so with anyone coming to the aid of Israel at that time, it would be futile because this is what God is doing. No matter what plan you come up with, what sort of ingenious uh, plans you have, nothing is going to prosper. He says, and I will put an end to all of her gaiety, her feast, her new moons, her Sabbaths, all her festivals, all the Sabbaths. So when someone wants to keep the Sabbaths with these, these different festivals and so forth, I'm not in it. I have nothing to do with you because you had nothing to do with me. However, this won't last forever. He says, I will destroy her vines and fig trees of which she said, these are my wages, which my lover had, has given me. And I will make them a, a forest and the and the beasts of the field will devour them. I will punish her for the days of the bells when she used to offer sacrifice to them and adorn herself with her earrings and jewelry and follow her lover so that she forgot me, declares the Lord. Now notice what he's getting ready to say though. And this is where it becomes really, really interesting to see what God is going to do with them. God's plan is now after going through all that, God is not interested in just punishing for punishment's sake. Now, when you go through something, there's two reasons. One, the reason why there's punishment is for two reasons, to either kill or to correct. Well, in this case, he is using this, though some are going to be killed, but he's also overall as a nation going to correct that nation and bring that nation back. Look what he says in verse 14. Therefore, behold, I will allure her 
bring her into the wilderness and speak kindly to her. The same Israel, the same people that he's going to deal harshly with and break them. He's going to deal kindly with them and bring them back. Then I will forgive her. Then I will give her her vineyards from there and the valley of Acre as a door of hope. And she will sing there as in the days of her youth, as in the day when she came up out of the land of Egypt. So we know we're talking about the nation of Israel. Uh, it will come about in that day, declares the Lord, that you will call me Ishi. The word Ishi, the word Ish, is where we get the word male or man or husband. And the E, the suffix is for my. So my husband, my Lord, my master, that's what she's going to call them. Uh, remember, God makes a statement that I was a husband husband to you but then when you forgot me you divorced me uh, and I will no long and will no longer call me Bali which is my lord uh, and this is kind of focusing on uh, the Baals or the false gods for I will remove the names of the Baals from her mouth so that she will so she will be mentioned by their names no more and in that day I will also make a covenant for them with the beasts of the field the birds of the sky the creeping things of the ground at this point in time, there is going to be peace. No more fighting, no more nothing. He says, I will abolish the bow, uh, the sword, and war from the land. I will make them lie down in safety, and I will betroth you to me forever. Yes, I will betroth you to me in righteousness and justice, in loving kindness and compassion. Now, who is he speaking of? Israel. So this is what he's going to do with Israel, and I will betroth you to me in faithfulness. Then you will know the Lord. Now, the issue is, or the question is, why would God do that? Well, God is making a picture to show how he is going to deal with, with treacherous Israel as well as adulterous and treacherous, treacherous Judah as well. But now he's going to introduce someone else that he's also going to show his loving kindness on, namely the Gentiles. If we drop down to verse 23, he says, I will sow her for myself in the land. Look what he says. I will also come have compassion on her who had not obtained compassion. And I will say to those who are not my people, you are my people. And they will say, you are my God. Who is he speaking of? Well, he's not just speaking of just Israel, just the Jews. He's also speaking of the Gentiles. Now, before we continue in chapter three, verse one, I want to bring up what he just said and show how he's speaking of not just Israel, but also the Gentiles. In Romans nine, Paul is speaking about how it's bothering him, how Gentiles are placing their faith in Christ, but Jews, but Israel has not. And so in chapter nine, he speaks about he would have this desire, wish that he could even be cut off from Christ himself if that meant for his people, Israel of the flesh, natural, physical Israel, not spiritual Israel, as someone might want to say. No, this is physical Israel. And notice what he what he brings up in chapter nine, verse 25. Uh, matter of fact, let's start from 24. He said, even us whom he also called, not from among the Jews only, but also from among the Gentiles, as he says in Hosea. So let's quote what Hosea just read. I will call those who are not my people, my people, and her who were, who were not beloved, beloved. And it shall be that in the place where, where it was said to them, you are not my people, there they shall be called sons of the living God. And so he's speaking of Israel and the Gentiles also having salvation. Now, this issue of salvation shows up, but let's go and see how he goes about doing it and see if you can see the picture of what God did for us as well as the Jews, but mainly for the Jews, but this also applies to us. See if you can see what he what he brings up in Hosea 3, how he brings them back, and see if this doesn't remind you of something that we all have in common. Chapter 3, verse 1 says, Then the Lord said to me, Go again, love a woman who is loved by her husband, yet an adulteress, even as the Lord loves the sons of Israel, though they turn to other gods and love raisin cakes. So I bought her for myself for 15 shekels of silver and a homer and a half of barley. Imagine having a wife and having to go and buy her back because she has decided to become a prostitute. She has decided to become a harlot. And so now she's a possession of others and you have to go and buy her back. Notice that term though, to buy her back. This is what Homer, this is what Gomer has to be uh, to Hosea, he has to buy her back, but he's not the only one that's buying someone back. Then I said to her, you shall stay with me for many days. You shall not play the harlot, nor shall you have a man. So I will also be towards you for the sons of Israel will remain for many days without king or prince, without sacrifice or sacred pillar and without ephod or household. Afterwards, the sons of Israel will return and seek the Lord, their God and David, their king, and they will come trembling to the Lord 
and to his goodness in the last days. But what's he speaking of? Speaking about having to buy her back. The same thing is used about his people uh, after the cross. The cross is what he uses to buy back Israel. Not all of Israel, obviously, and not even all of the Gentiles. But that is the mechanism. That is the currency that he decides to use to buy us back. Not 15 shekels, but his blood. Now, the question is, why would he do that? Why would he not just let them go? Well, Ezekiel brings this up in 1660. He says, nevertheless, verse 60, I will remember my covenant with you in the days of your youth, and I will establish an everlasting covenant. Then you remember your ways and be ashamed when you receive your sister's both your older and your younger, and I will give them to you as daughters, but not because of your covenant. Thus, I will establish my covenant with you and you shall know that I am the Lord. And so what is he going to do? Even though you have violated the covenant, even though you have um, broken the covenant, even though you have acted dishonorably and forgotten about me, says God, I will still come back and make an everlasting covenant with you that you will never break, that you will never forget, you will never leave. And so we see him using Hosea and Gomer kind of in that picture. But again, not just with Israel, because even in Israel's disobedience and their adulterous ways, what does God decide to do? Not only pay for purchase them back, Israel, but also make plans to call other people who are not his people. Now, he doesn't fully explain this in Hosea, but in other passages like in Deuteronomy as well as in Romans. He says the point of doing that is to make them jealous. So he's going to make Israel jealous, interestingly enough, who is playing the adulteress with other people, causing her to be jealous. And so what is he going to do? He's going to purchase both of those people, purchase the Gentiles and the Jews, those who place their faith in Christ. He is going to purchase them with his blood. Again, not with the 15 shekels, but with a better price, with a better currency. And so why does he have Hosea to marry Gomer to show a picture of what he is going to do for the nation of Israel, as well as for those Gentiles who place their faith in Christ. Amen.